Welcome back everyone to this lecture on elastic net where we're going to learn about combining L1 and L2 regularization. We've already been able to perform ridge regression and lasso regression on their own. We also know that lasso is able to shrink coefficients all the way down to zero, but we never really took a deeper dive into how it actually achieves this in detail or why that is. We just told you that the penalty term, that is the sum of the absolute values, happens to allow you to put coefficients all the way to zero. Now the ability behind its capability to actually shrink down to zero becomes more clear when we begin to learn about elastic net, which is going to allow us to combine lasso and ridge together. So let's start by actually diving a little deeper into lasso and ridge separately. So let's begin with lasso. Lasso was originally introduced in geophysics literature in 1986 by Symes and Santosa and it was later independently rediscovered and popularized in 1996 by Robert Tib Shirani, who coined the actual term lasso. So if you actually take a look at the lasso Wikipedia page, you'll see that Robert Tib Shirani is there as the person that coined the actual term. Now you may be thinking, this name actually sounds a little bit familiar. And if it does sound familiar to you, that is good news because it means you've been doing the reading, since Robert is actually one of the authors of ISLR. And in fact, all the authors have a history of very impressive accomplishments, which eat with each of the authors actually having their own Wikipedia article. So hopefully this is enough evidence to you that this isn't just some other random book on statistics or mathematics. It is the book on statistical learning and machine learning. Hopefully that convinces you to definitely start doing the reading assignments. But let's go ahead and move on to discussing Lasso and Ridge. We can show that we can rewrite Lasso and Ridge as the following equations where we are minimizing the residual sum of squares subject to a condition. And that condition is that penalty term. And essentially, if we take a closer look at this condition that we're subject to, we can derive that there is some sum S, which allows us to rewrite the penalty as a, a subject to requirement of residual sum of squares. So essentially for lasso, we can say minimize residual sum of squares subject to over on the top one, the sum of the absolute values being less than or equal to s. And obviously s is going to change depending on the set of features you're working with. So s is just some sum that must exist that you're subject to. And then same thing for ridge regression. On the bottom, there is residual sum of squared errors that you're trying to minimize. However, you're subject to the square of the beta coefficients being less than or equal to some sum s. And the reason we're not really defining what s could be is because it's going to change depending on your feature set. But we are separating out residual sum of squares versus the penalty in order to later on plot this on the coefficient plane. And you'll see what that means in just a second. So let's start with a simple thought experiment. We're going to deal with a very simple set of features, and there's only two of them, which means we're going to solve a simple equation where our y hat is equal to some beta 1 times x1 plus some beta 2 times x2. And we know that regularization can be expressed as simply an additional requirement we're subject to for residual sum of squares. So that means for L1, L1 is going to constrain the sum of absolute values and L2 is going to constrain the sum of the squared values. And specifically, we mentioned for some set of features, there's going to be some sum S that the penalty is less than. Meaning for the case of only two features, in the case of lasso regression, for some set of features, the case of lasso regression means you're gonna minimize RSS subject to the absolute value of beta one plus the absolute value of beta two being less than or equal to some value s. Same for ridge regression penalty. You're gonna minimize residual sum of squares. However, you're subject to your beta one squared plus your beta two squared being less than or equal to some value s. So what would this actually look like for the subject to term if you're plotting it out? Well, let's just plot that penalty region. If we're thinking about the value that exists s for some feature set, and we were to plot this out on beta two versus beta one, essentially the coefficients, then the lasso penalty region would look like this. So this is the region to consider for some value of S, where the absolute value of beta one 
plus the absolute value of beta 2 has to be less than or equal to some sum s. And you can imagine for a different feature set, maybe s is a little bigger, but you can see how this region would actually grow or shrink. For the case of lasso, it ends up being this diamond shape. And that's going to also expand into different dimensions as well. You'll get these higher level square-like geometries just in higher dimensions. Now for ridge regression, if we're saying we're gonna reduce or minimize RSS subject to the penalty of beta one squared plus beta two squared being less than or equal to some S value, then that's going to look like when we plot beta two versus beta one, like a circle. So essentially we have a circle when we're dealing with two features and you can imagine you'd have a sphere for three features and then they're called hyperspheres for higher and higher dimensions. And of course, for a different set of features, maybe your S region is larger, but the main idea being here that there is some S that your beta squared coefficients have to be less than or equal to. And in the case of two dimensions or two beta coefficients, this is going to look like a circle. So what does that actually mean in regards to calculating these weights or these beta coefficients? Well, what would residual sum of squares actually look like? We can think of the minimization path for the residual sum of squares as just lines we're essentially solving for, trying to find the coefficients that minimize that loss function. So obviously you would kind of start solving for these with gradient descents. And you could begin to start solving these, but remember, you're gonna be subject to that penalty term being less than or equal to S. So what's gonna happen is for ridge regression, as you're trying to solve for the correct beta coefficients, you're being regularized based off the subject to this penalty. So for ridge regression, basically that has to come down and end up making some sort of tangent contact with that circle or sphere for higher dimensions. For lasso, you're gonna end up making contact with that diamond shape. And note the difference of what's happening here on ridge versus lasso. Basically for lasso, this convex object that lies tangent to the boundary is likely to encounter a corner of a hypercube. And we say hypercube, but in two dimensions, this is just a square. In three coefficients, it'd be a cube. And then in more higher dimensions, we'd call it a hypercube. So that's all we're saying. So again, that convex object that is trying to solve that residual sum of squares that lies tangent to the boundary that's gonna encounter the corner of the hypercube. So essentially what we're saying here is just Geometrically speaking, as you're minimizing residual sum of squares and you're subject to that lasso penalty, because it's in the shape of a hypercube, you're highly likely to encounter a corner. And recall the corner of the cube, in this case, the corner of the squares for two dimensions, means one of the coefficients on that corner is gonna be zero, just by definition of how this is centered. So again, to make it clear from a geometry perspective, for lasso, we're dealing with hypercubes. And in the simplest case, we're gonna have just two features here to make that square. And it's highly likely if you come into contact with something in the shape of a square that you're gonna hit one of those corners, meaning one of those coefficients is going to be zero. This is why lasso is likely to lead to coefficients going all the way to zero. This is unlike ridge, which is the case of an n-sphere or hypersphere, and the points on the boundary for which some of the components of beta are zero are actually not distinguished from the others. And the convex object is no more likely to contact the point at which some components of beta are zero than one for which none of them are. So this is why ridge is not gonna be like lasso in producing coefficients that result in zero because it's gonna have that n sphere shape. So again, this is why lasso is more likely to lead to coefficients as zero and I should point out that while we drew the beta coefficients from residual sum of squares as just straight lines, people often also diagram them as just contour lines. But to the same effect where you're gonna hit one of the corners in lasso, which ends up making one of the coefficients zero, or at least highly likely that many of the coefficients are gonna be zero when you start dealing with these higher dimensional cubes. So what elastic net seeks to do is to improve on both L1 and L2 regularization by combining them. So here we can see the full error term we're trying to minimize when it comes to elastic net. We have that residual sum of squares 
plus the squared penalty and the absolute value penalty. So again, minimizing both the squared and absolute value terms along with RSS. And it's important to note that there's actually two distinct lambda values for each penalty. You have lambda one in this case, which is going to go for the penalty of ridge, and lambda two, which is going for the penalty of lasso. Now, alternatively, what you can do is instead of expressing this as two lambdas, you can express this as a lambda on the outside and an alpha value on the inside, where the alpha value is just the ratio between the actual lasso versus ridge. So there's going to exist some set of alpha here and another lambda, which corresponds to lambda one and lambda two of the previous expression. So this is a little more convenient in terms of programming because it allows us to just set alpha kind of as a ratio. We can see again here that if alpha was equal to zero, that would mean we're just considering beta squared. Or if alpha was equal to one, then we only be considering absolute value of beta. And this is the kind of most simplified notation where we're trying to say minimize the residual sum of squares plus some lambda two times beta squared plus some lambda two times the sum of beta one. Now what does this actually look like in regards to this penalty region? Here we can see the dashed lines for lasso as that square and ridge as that circle. And what happens when you begin to calculate this as a kind of subject to elastic net penalty, it kind of ends up looking like a bit of a curved cube or curved square. Let's go ahead and explore how to perform elastic net with Python and scikit-learn by heading over to the Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so here we are at the Jupyter Notebook. As you may have guessed, using ElasticNet with Scikit-Learn is pretty much going to be the exact same process as the Lasso CV model or the Ridge CV model that we used. We can say from sklearn.linear model import, in this case we're going to say ElasticNet CV. And obviously for something like ElasticNet, you'll definitely need to use cross-validation to get reasonable results for what the ratio should be, as well as what your outside lambda should be. And the way sklearn does this is it essentially says you have this L1 ratio, which is a float ratio between 0 and 1, which is how much are you going to do for L1 versus how much are you going to do for L2. And then what you do here is, remember, we have that outside lambda in the equation, in this case, that inside of scikit-learn is actually referred to as the alpha. So you have this idea of the epsilon and n number of alphas, just as we had with lasso. So that's pretty much it for setting this up. Alternatively, you could provide a list of alphas, but I'd recommend just using EPS and n number of alphas. And then you can also provide a list of L1 ratios to try. So you can see here this list. And in general, it says that you should go more towards lasso and less close to ridge, since more likely than not, it's probably a good idea to put some of those coefficients to zero. So you can see here, it's starting to guide you more towards lasso. Okay, so let's go ahead and check this out. What we need to do here is say elastic model or elastic CV model, whatever you want to call it, is an instance of elastic net CV. And then I'm actually going to choose for L1 ratio that list that they provide for us right here. Let's go ahead and just grab those values from the documentation. And obviously you can experiment with these, but again, I'd recommend that you follow with their advice and try to go more towards options of lasso. Keep in mind, it's still gonna try doing 0.1, which is kind of 10% lasso, 90% ridge, but it's starting to lean more towards lasso. And then let's pass in the other parameters. The main other parameters was that epsilon parameter. If we come back up here, it's epsilon, which is that ratio and then number of alphas. You can recall from our dealings with lasso that we may have to come back here and increase max iterations depending on the size of this epsilon value. So let's do the following. We'll come back to the notebook. We're going to say epsilon is equal to something like 0 0.001. And let's go ahead and say the number of alphas to consider is 100 and let's have max iterations be high enough so we don't get any issues. So we'll say kind of 1 million or something like that. Go ahead and create that model and then let's train it on the training data. So we're gonna say elastic model fit to x train, y train. And what it's gonna do is a cross validation to check out not just these alpha values but also the ratio between them to make sure everything matches up. 
make sure you don't get confused. Technically speaking, this alpha is not the same alpha I showed in the equation in the slides. It's the lambda outside. L1 ratio refers to the alpha from the equation. I know that can be a little confusing that scikit-learn kind of plays around with those parameter names, but it's just the nature of scikit-learn, trying to make every single class as uniform as possible. Okay, so let's go ahead and fit this. You'll notice it took a tiny bit longer than just lasso by itself, not that bad. And if we take a look at the elastic model, the first thing we should check out is L1 ratio. And you'll notice it reports back the L1 ratios it tried. And then if you want the best performing L1 ratio, put an underscore after that. And typically, the underscore after an attribute name off a trained model is going to be some feature hyperparameter of the model itself. So if you do underscore one, you'll notice that it actually reports back 1.0, which means it's basically disregarding Ridge completely and decided Lasso was the way to go. So again, it's 100% an L1 model. Don't be surprised for really simple data sets if the Elastic model just says, okay, go ahead and choose L1 completely. Keep in mind, obviously our values were more skew skewed towards L1 to begin with, but this is not uncommon for really simple data sets. So in that case, we can keep running test predictions, or if you want, you can also explore Elastic model and then check the alpha value as well, and it says the alpha value is 0 0.0049. If you scroll back up to our lasso CV model, we can also check the alpha value there. So let's check lasso CV model dot alpha from before, and you notice that it's extremely similar to the point where it's actually the exact same value. So our elastic model has essentially just duplicated what our lasso CV model was, which means we're essentially gonna get the same results. So if I say elastic model dot predict off the text set and then set that as test predictions, I should pretty much be getting the same results as I got before. So I can say mean absolute error is equal to mean absolute error, y test, test predictions. And you check it out here, it's 0 0.433. If we scroll back up to our lasso model, that was also 0 0.433. So essentially what I'm saying is ElasticNet decided, hey, just put everything towards Lasso. That's going to be your best performing model. All right, so hopefully you can see for the case of future regression projects that you need to do, it makes sense to just go straight towards ElasticNet CV, keep an L1 ratio that allows you to go fully to Ridge or fully to Lasso, and not even bother trying with Lasso or Ridge by themselves, since theoretically ElasticNet could just revert to a simple L1 model or L2 model on its own. Okay, that's it for regularization with linear regression. I'll see you at the next lecture.